Hey, all righty, I should be live. Uh, let me know if the sound is good and all of that. If you hear something in the background, that's my air conditioner going. And no, I am not going to turn it off. It's been brutally humid all week, and it's not going to get any better even tomorrow. We had some bad storms come through yesterday morning, and that just made the humidity worse. So uh, spending the day in a hot building up near the rafters putting hurricane clips on, it's like I'm pretty well fried, so you just have to bear with the air conditioner. Anyhow, I'm going to do some lead testing. A lot of people are concerned about lead in cast iron. Uh, sometimes I've seen videos on YouTube where people have used old cast iron skillets to melt lead. And uh, they're also concerned, you know, that uh, older enameled cast iron might have lead in the enamel. And uh, another thing that's fairly common is kettles. A lot of times people will paint them, use them for flower pots, and uh, it could be lead paint. But there's an easy way to test for lead. You can get these at pretty much any hardware store. They're little instant lead tests. They're little swabs. I'll show you how they work. You usually you'll find these by the smoke alarms. They usually have the smoke alarms, mold test kits, lead test kits, you know, a couple other sort of things are health and safety section in the uh, in the hardware store. They're not really cheap. There's eight of them in here. In retail, they were $27 for eight of them. I've seen them cheaper online. You can get, this is an eight pack, you can get bigger packages and they're a little cheaper if you buy more of them, but you can get them online. Like I say, you can get them at hardware stores. You want to test things out. All you do when you get this open is you, the instructions are on the back. It's got a little instruction pamphlet in there and it's got some little, little test confirmation card. I'm not quite sure what that is. I believe you test your swab. If it comes up negative, swab it on that. It should turn positive. I don't recall. I just read the instructions on the back for basic use. Anyway, comes in a little thing like this. Inside of there, there's a couple of vials and a little cotton swab on the end. What you do is you crush it, you break the vials, you shake it a couple of times, mix it up, and there's yellow liquid. You give it a little squeeze until you start getting the yellow liquid coming out of the swab. Now, I'm going to start off with something that should definitely turn positive. This is my lead ladle, and I've used it fairly recently, so I know this is contaminated with lead. What you do is you now rub it on there for 30 seconds. i got my timer. I'll start that. And you squeeze gently so that it gets a little bit of the fluid on there. And what you're looking for is, I'm not sure if you can see down in there, you're looking for the swab to turn red or pink. Rub, rub, rub. There's my timer going off. And you can see that is definitely strongly red. And like I said, it should be because this is a lead ladle. Now, cast iron skillets that have been used for melting lead. Quiet. Uh, cast iron skillets have been used for melting lead. If it's fairly recent, you can tell there might be a little bit of lead residue in there, a little bit of slag stuck to them. And lead melts at, I believe, 650, 700 degrees. So you can tell that they've been over a high heat. And uh, you can see the back of that. You know, it looks like it's been pretty hot. But if it's was used quite a while ago and has gotten rusty since then, you're not really going to be able to see that. And uh, it'll also, it'll burn any crud off of there. It'll be burnt clean because of the high temperature involved with uh, melting lead. So it can be kind of tough. If you suspect that it's been used for that, you know, go ahead and get you some of these and that'll show you whether or not it's been used. 
All right. The next, the next thing I get a lot of questions about, you know, and see a lot of comments in different places, is old enamel. Lead hasn't been really used in cast iron enamel since about 1900. Usually anything after that, you're pretty safe. It's pretty unlikely that there's going to be any lead in there anyway. Certain colors that never was used and uh, certain colors it was, you know, whites and reds tended to have lead in them sometimes because uh, white lead and red lead were real common pigments. But it wasn't used a whole lot in uh, cast iron enameling, but it was some, you know, prior to 1900. This is an old gate marked on the bottom there. Nice little, nice little uh, kettle. It's enameled inside and outside, white enamel. It's got a little hook on the side and a pour spout so you can pour it real easy. And it has these, uh, we call that a cow horn style of ears on there. This was probably made, you know, between 1880 and maybe 1910 or so. So what I'm going to do is I got to get myself another little swab. It comes in a well, it's a tube I already used. Ah. Let me get another swab ready here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of fine sandpaper. And I'm just going to lightly kind of scuff on the very bottom edge there. Scuff that up a little bit. That way you get a little bit of dust and it'll, uh, you know, expose some of the, the uh, enamel underneath. And that should give us a little better test. So I don't want to make a huge scuff mark on it, but just enough to kind of roughen it up a little bit. Without making it too obvious. Okay, I can remember where that is. Get my next little tester ready. Give that a shake and squeeze it down a little bit. Okay, I got some liquid. Hit my timer. And we start rubbing it. Now, if a kettle is from before 1900, you know, a gate mark kettle is usually before 1900. And, you know, like I say, you know, most of your brand named ones, you should be able to find out when it was made. It might be a good idea to test it. Like I said, you're pretty safe. With anything after that and anything by you know mostly Griswold Wagner favorite you know some of the bigger names they were made mostly after 1900 anyway so they shouldn't be now that is still yellow and if I remember right this little test card should make it turn red just to confirm that the test was working right I think I'll give that a little rub here and we'll see what happens yeah, it turns that kind of pinkish. It turns that. That way you can, you know, make sure that your test was actually working is the idea behind these things. So I read up on them before, but uh, kind of forgot about that one a little bit. Anyhow, so that's negative for lead, so that should be good to go. It'll be safe to use this for any sort of thing like that. Now, if you do get a uh, kettle that has lead in the enamel, if it's not if it's not enameled inside and it's just enameled outside, it'll still be okay to use it. But uh, if it's enameled inside and there's lead in the enamel, don't use it for food. You know, it's good for decoration and things like that. Now, the last little bit that I was going to do was kettles. I just got this. This is a flat bottom kettle. It's a Wagner. Hopefully you can see that. I haven't done anything with it. You can just see that that is a Wagner and that uh, that style of, of uh, logo, it's in quotation marks, arched. This is an old one. This is from somewhere between 1892 and 1910, maybe. That's a number eight. You can just see the eight down there. I think that means more it's an eight quart rather than a size eight. But anyway, a lot of uh, kettles got painted. This has been painted at some point. And I don't know if that's lead paint on there. And that's something you really got to be 
careful of with get it, buying a painted kettle and redoing it. Now, removing paint, if I get something that's painted, I usually remove it with a, uh, a citrus-based paint stripper first. And that does a really good job, and it's fairly low on the toxic. You know, it's not like the old-fashioned paint stripper that was pretty nasty stuff. But the, uh, the citrus-based citrus paint strippers are fairly mild and not terribly toxic. But you got to scrub the hell out of them when you're done. And then I run it through the, the uh, usual lye and electrolysis after that. So far, I haven't got one that's been lead-painted. So uh, I've been fairly lucky on that. But this one here, I'll do the same thing. I'll scuff up that paint. Just get a little bit of roughness going there. And I'll grab another test stick here. There we go. That's the one I got open. Get this out. And these, uh, these little test swabs, you can use them on quite a few different things, on metals, on paints, on dust, painted wood, things like that. So they're real versatile for testing all sorts of lead things around the house. Now, a little bit squeezed down there. Hit my timer. And we'll give that a good rubbing. Hmm. This might be a problem. I might have to use a different one on this because picking up that that uh, dust has turned the end of it black from the paint. But I'll let this kind of sit and soak a little while, and I might be able to, uh, you know, as it kind of wicks away from the very tip, that might change color away from the, uh, away from the black. So let me grab another one, and I'll just try rubbing it on a spot that isn't, hasn't been, uh, scuffed up. Your phone's buffering. Yeah, YouTube's been doing that again lately. You know, for a while they were really bad for constantly buffering on things. And uh, they seem to be kind of back at that. It seems like every time they try and do something new, you end up having a hell of a time with them buffering. And we'll try it up here. Hopefully I won't pick up so much black this time around. Three, two, one. Okay. Yeah, I didn't pick up the black this time. And uh, that there is showing negative. It's just the yellow from the, from the liquid inside. And this one here, you might not be able to quite see it, but it's leached. You know, it's wicked some of the yellow down behind the uh, black part. And there's no red showing. You know, where after they sat for a while, these ones here, you see the red is soaked up farther. Where's that first one? Come here, you go. That's got crud on it now. Anyway, these here, like I said, they're not really cheap, but they're not really expensive, and they're pretty good peace of mind if you're worried about lead. So... This here doesn't have lead paint on it, so I'm happy about that. Uh, even if it is lead, uh, lead paint, and you take it off of the stripper and dispose of that properly and scrub it good, you should be able to get rid of the lead just in the process of stripping the paint. If there's any residue on there, 
you might not be able to use the uh, use the pot after that. Scrub it up good, see what happens. Test it again because you can, uh, you know, electrolysis and lye will both remove paint to a pretty good degree, but then you're going to end up with lead contamination in your lye bath or your electrolysis tank. And you kind of defeat the purpose because you could end up contaminating something else if it's, you know, a strong enough concentration of lead. So, if you have any, uh, any doubts about whether or not something has lead in it, go ahead and test it. You can get the testers really, like I say, most hardware stores got them. I found these in two little, you know, rinky-dink small town hardware stores. So, pretty much anywhere ought to have them. One other thing I hear now and then is that sometimes cheap Asian imported cast iron has lead in the iron itself. It's pretty unlikely. It is, it, in theory, it is possible. There is a type of cast iron called machinable cast iron that does have lead in it, but the lead isn't alloyed with the iron. It's like the, the lead is like the graphite in cast iron. It's more little pockets of lead you know, embedded and incorporated through the iron, and it kind of acts as a lubricant when you're machining it, turning it on a lathe, something like that. But it's not a very common iron to begin with, and, uh, you know, it's fairly expensive because it's tricky to make it and to get it right. So some of that can turn up as scrap and wind up getting used to make other cast iron items, including pans. But so far, nobody's really seen any uh anybody who's tested a lot of chinese and taiwanese and you know generally low low cost imported stuff show the test kit again yeah and uh nobody's really found any of it you know theoretically it is possible but it's pretty unlikely and you know so far nobody's come across it so you're not going to uh to run into that sort of thing if at all and when you remelt like a suburban self-reliance doesn't get too hot in the molten iron. Uh, I'm not sure what lead vaporizes that. You know, it's uh, it melts around 700, 650 to 700, but I think the point where it actually vaporizes is a good bit higher. But like I said, it doesn't really form an alloy with the iron. It's more of a mixture. You know, it's an amalgamation, kind of like the uh, fillings in your teeth. Anyway. And uh, the lead will want to separate out when you remelt the iron. So you're probably not going to get any, but there's a chance. So if you're worried about it, you can go ahead and test it. Uh, here's what the lead test. There's different brands, but these are most common 3M. You know, they're a good, high quality brand name. And you can get these little things. Like I said, pretty much any hardware store will have them. Usually by their smoke detectors because they'll have mold tests and asbestos tests and tests for your water you know it's kind of like home health and safety equipment you know the smoke detectors carbon monoxide detectors these things and uh yeah asian pans might not have lead but most are low quality there are some that are pretty good you know usually the uh, taiwan and korean ones are better than a lot of the chinese ones although there are some chinese ones that are good so uh you know, just learn how to spot the difference between good iron and bad, and you'll be okay. And in fact, I was going to show you, once I got done playing around with my lead, I was going to show you my acquisition for the week. Most collectors aren't really interested in Asian imports, but there is one type of pan that is starting to draw a little bit of collector's attention. It's a nice little pan. You know, it's machined good on the inside. A little bit rough on the outside, but it's pretty decent iron. It's made in Taiwan, and they call these tank pans. The reason they call them tank pans is because the logo is a little tank. Ain't that cool? This, this is a number three, six and a half inch skeleton made in Taiwan. And they got a little tank logo on them. Now, usually I, uh, I'm more of a type collector. You know, I'd like to have, you know, one or two nice examples of a particular type, you know, particular brand or style or, you know, item. You know, I don't need to put together an entire set of skillets. Something like this, I think I probably would try to. This is the only one I've come across so far. But uh, I'd definitely try and 
put a set of these together just for the fun of it because they're kind of neat little pans a cute little tank on them and you know they're made in taiwan so most people aren't all that interested in them because there's cheap little pans but uh i guess pretty cool i'll have to get that cleaned up uh when you use graphite electrodes there's a layer of lead appear on the cast after cleaning no there's there shouldn't be any lead in graphite graphite's just carbon you know the lead in the pencil is actually graphite it isn't lead anymore used to be you know hundreds and hundreds of years ago but it's just graphite now and uh you might be picking up a layer of graphite you know which will have that kind of you know greasy leady sort of look to it like pencil lead like you're rubbed a pencil on something but no there shouldn't be any lead in it yeah uh i'm gonna back up through the uh through the comments and catch up on everybody here you know kind of watch while i was playing with the test but i was paying more attention to them actually you got chinese korean and taiwans that perform flawlessly and i paid less than 20 bucks for all five of them yeah you know, i mean if it's a good pan it's a good pan no matter where it comes from and they can be cheaper and if you know they'll cook just as good as anything else kind of scroll back all the way back here uh, let's see, I didn't say hi to everybody either. Got Cast Iron Reso Restore, Sonoto 145, Billy Lee Lawton, Ron Thompson. Hi, guys. Cameron Sheldon. Fairy Queen, that's good to see ya. Oh, uh, well, I don't want to start my videos with a drink anymore. I probably should. Usually I'm pretty tired after work and I could use a drink to relax my aching self. <laughs> I usually do that in my cooking videos. You know, I haven't really done that in the live streams. You know, it's usually when I'm cooking something. So, when I get around to cooking the next one, I'll probably do that. Uh, Cameron, hi from Idaho. Howdy. Strong's Adventures, good to see you. Hit that thumbs up. Yeah, hit that thumbs up button. YouTube likes it when you do that. They start recommending you more wrong. They start recommending your videos in the uh, recommended videos list. Yeah, it might be safe from a lead standpoint, but it looks too much like a bed chamber pot to make comfortable cooking in it. Yeah, you wouldn't want to cook in a chamber pot. Uh, you might get them cleaned out, but you never know. Uh, can everybody hear this okay? Uh, do, is my uh, volume low? Or is that background noise kind of drowning me out? Suburban self-reliance. Yeah, the light tank, like I said, it will remove paint and things like that. But uh, if you have, if you strip off light paint in your light tank, strip off lead paint in your lie tank, then you'll have lead in your lie, and you'll end up contaminating everything you do after that. Usually takes an hour, forty-five minutes to watch me. Uh, Teresa Wilkinson, hi, and I uh, showed you the test kit again. Molten iron. My old computer died, got a new one, none of my speakers works, and it's got one inside the tower itself. Not very good, though. Yeah, the, the uh, little onboard speaker isn't terribly good. Wonder why wouldn't your uh, other speakers work? That's kind of odd. Usually it's just a, you know, stereo audio jack somewhere, either on the back on the sound card or a lot of them got a jack in the front, too. Everybody, Chinese, Korean. Start recommending you more on. Uh, bootleg to case, few cases of spotted cow a couple of weeks ago from a Wisconsin visit. Yeah, I got uh, cousins that live out in Colorado. I had an uncle who was career Air Force, and he was stationed at the Air Force Academy for years. And uh, they'd come to Wisconsin, and they'd bring cases and cases of Coors because nobody could get Coors here in those days. And they'd haul back tons and tons of lining, lining kugels with them. Just bathed your dog as she got out and rolled. It's been raining, so yeah, you're probably gonna have to wash her all over again. That yeah, spotted cow's all right. I'm not really a big beer drinker anymore. I usually just stick to whiskey. Let's 
and I think that's got me pretty well caught up. Becky Brown, hi Becky, good to see you. Yeah, I gotta bring back lots of cheese. Yeah, that's expected of you. Uh, see, important question: Who's my favorite superhero? Hmm. Never really got too hugely into comic books and uh, superhero movies. I've seen a few of them. You know, see, I think I saw the first Iron Man movie and a couple of the X Men movies when they first came out. You know, some of the Batman ones, but I never really followed them all that all that closely. But if I had to pick a favorite, who would I pick? Hmm. Yeah, cast iron man. Uh, I got a three-piece hammered Korean set. That's fine. Yeah, like I say, I mean they're good pans. You know, if it's a good pan, it's a good pan. You gotta, you know, you gotta be more worried about how well it's gonna work. You know, what kind of quality it is, rather than getting too hung up on name brands. And uh, I see way back there. Uh, Billy Lee mentioned that you like the uh, electrolysis video. You know, it's going good. I've been just been running pretty much steady ever since the video, since I got it going. Did a couple more pans, and right now I got a. Uh, can't remember if I ever showed it on a live stream or not. It's a uh, Alfred Anderson uh, heart shaped waffle iron. I got it for I think, it was, I think I paid thirty five bucks for it, forty bucks at an antique store. It's missing a handle and doesn't have a base. But it's a really cool little, real cool little uh, waffle iron. I don't know why I did it to myself. Waffle irons are a pain to restore. All the little nooks and crannies getting in there and scrubbing. But it's out there in the electrolysis tank fizzling away. Yeah, Iron Man, of course. Yeah, and the first Iron Man movie is pretty good, too. I like that. Whiskey Man has a W instead of an S. That'd be a good one, too. There's not enough liquored up superheroes out there. Yeah, video spotting good quality work across. Yeah, it does. All makers, foreign and domestic, new and old. You know, I mean, there's some old pans that, you know, aren't nearly as good quality as the rest of them. And, uh, you know, you can see it. You know, I mean, they're a lot, you know, a lot rougher. You know, you can tell that there wasn't as much finished work done on them. And, uh, you know, lower grade iron, like uh, some of the southern mystery skillets, you can tell that they were, you know, pretty much handmade in a, you know, like a blacksmith shop or a foundry. You know, it's not really good casting compared to some of the, uh, some of the other ones that are around at the same time. They're still nice pans, most of them, and uh, even some of the rougher ones, you know, they work pretty good. They cook good. I got, I got one. No, I only have the one. They call it a Southern Mystery Skillet. I don't have it right handy, but uh, I think I showed that in a video quite a while ago. They're all kind of made on a common pattern. They all look more or less alike. They usually have a raised number on the handle, and uh, they're a little bit shallower than most pans. And they're pretty distinctive looking, but nobody knows quite who made them because there were a lot of different people that made them. And... Uh, you know, a few of them have initials on them. Some of them, there's a couple that have actual maker's marks on them. You know, but most of them are unmarked. And uh, my theory is that there was some enterprising blacksmith supply company that sold a bunch of this particular pattern to local blacksmiths. And most of them were made in the South. You know, and they sold these because it's not really difficult, you know, especially if you already have a blacksmith shop to set up a furnace that you can melt iron in and make cast iron implements and in the uh in the uh olden days you know there was a lot of other things that are made out of cast iron besides just cookware there's a lot of tools and a lot of different household and farm implements that were cast so uh you know blacksmiths quite often did do a little bit of casting and foundry work on the side you know just to make more business and i think uh you know somebody supplied this pattern you know to blacksmiths across the south and, uh, you know, that's why they all have, you know, they all pretty much look the same, like they're all made from the same 
pattern, even though it was a lot of different makers. Or it could be they all just, you know, there was a particular popular brand of skillet at the time and everybody copied them. You know, most of them were made from, you know, about 1880 up until the 1920s. You know, and after that, you know, the bigger companies started taking over. And as the, uh, you know, distribution got better, roads, railroads, you know, and uh, things like that, you know, the South used to be intensely rural, up here used to be intensely rural, you know, up until the 20s. You know, once they started getting better roads, they started getting a lot more transportation, and they kind of crawled it out, a lot of the homemade stuff like that. Ah, uh, Brendo, thanks for the five dollars. That's very kind of you. I appreciate it. Uh, you're late. You're working. You'll catch the replay. Well, okay. Glad that you can stop by at any rate. Uh, whiskey iron. Same folks that you cry and moan about foreign cast iron. Usually have many other foreign manufacturers, factory products that are home to some degree. Yeah, I mean, uh, even cars. You know, when you think of Ford, Chevy, Chrysler as American cars. Really, the only thing that uh, the automakers do in the United States anymore is final assembly work. It all comes in from, you know, mostly Mexico, you know, some of it from other countries. Basically, it's modules. I mean, the engine and transmission and drive line will be one unit, and you just drop the body on top of it, stick a couple bolts in, hook up the shocks and wiring, and you're done. And, uh, you know, like putting the seat in the car as it comes on the assembly line takes one person. But it takes probably 40 people to actually build that seat, you know, cut the metal parts, weld it all together, you know, upholstery, all that sort of thing. And those are the jobs that got shipped to Mexico decades ago. And now it's a lot cheaper to build the parts and components overseas and ship it back and put it together in the United States and call it an American car. Yeah, if they're online crying, they're crying with a foreign-made device. Yeah, I mean, even a computer that's put together in the U.S., it's pretty much all, all the chips are made overseas. And the same thing with a lot of pharmaceuticals. That's one of the big reasons why there's been so many problems with the uh, uh, supply chain and pharmaceuticals when China shut down because of the epidemic. You know, a lot of uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers actually pretty dirty work. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of things, I mean, think of basically an industrial scale meth lab. And that's pretty much what you're, uh, what you're dealing with. Toyota has the most American parts of any car company. Yeah, probably. You know, a lot of it, uh, you know, a lot of it's cheaper for them to make overseas. Some of it's cheaper for a foreign company to make in the United States and put together here. You know, it's. It's weird the way some of the taxes work out because you can, uh, even though they have a plant in the U.S. assembling, you know, Volkswagens or Toyotas, a lot of times what the car companies will do is they'll have the uh, American branch set up as a subsidiary company that's buying the parts from, you know, say Germany, well, even though Germany, most of the Volkswagen parts aren't made in Germany anymore either. But they'll import the parts from the parent company at a price to where in order to sell the final product, they sell it at just barely break even. So officially they don't make any profit, but the parent company makes all the profit selling itself the parts. You know, it's, it's quite the scam that they've worked out over the years and you know, pretty much every corporation, whether it's American or domestic, whether it's foreign or domestic, does the same thing. Yeah, nothing beats Wagner and Griswold, though, and BSR. Yeah, I mean, they are, you know, Griswolds are they're very light, thin. They're uh, really well finished. And, uh, you know, BSR, same thing. They're heavier. They're always known to be a lot heavier. Favorites are real good pans. I like Wapak. I got a couple of them. You know, they're kind of a, kind of a renegade company right from the start. Their quality varies. They're notoriously famous for uh, little casting deflect, defects and sand shift. You know, sometimes you'll see, like on the back of a skill, you'll see kind of an irregular line. It doesn't really look like a crack. And what that is, it's where the sand shifted when they took the pattern out of the mold 
or before they're or while they're pouring it, it would kind of move a little bit, and you get a little bit of misalignment in the uh, in the sand and the mold itself, and uh, you know it shows up later on. They're known for that, but other than that, they really cook great. I mean, they're nice pans, and uh, yeah, I'm kind of partial to you know the real antique Wagner. You know, because, uh, you know, probably because it's a little more common than a lot of other things around here. But I kind of like the way they look. Yeah, I bought a Chinese knockoff of a well-known luxury watch brand. It keeps time more accurately than some you paid big money for. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's funny. If something works, it works. I mean, that's really how it goes. Piqua, yeah, uh, favorite was a real good one. And I've been told it's more pronounced more Piqua instead of Piqua, but I'm here, so this is my accent, and that's the way I say Piqua. Uh, my raised number six Lodge is your favorite. Yeah, uh, Lodge made a lot of good pans for a lot of years, especially the vintage ones, you know, the one and two notch. They were a little lighter and thinner. Then uh, they got quite a bit heavier later on. But they... Uh, you know, they've always been pretty good pans. Uh, did Sears and Montgomery Wards sell cast iron? Yeah, they did. In fact, a lot of the uh, a lot of the unmarked Wagner ware was sold through Sears and Montgomery Wards. Uh, Griswold and Favorite both made uh, a brand called called uh, Puritan. You know, some was made by Griswold, some by Favorite. And that was sold through Sears. Uh, there's Good Health, Best Health. Those were catalog brand names. Uh, like I said, the Unmarked Wagner, most of those were sold through catalogs and discount stores like Montgomery Ward and Sears. Uh, the same with the Griswold Iron Mountain range. They call it the Iron Mountain series. They were unmarked. And uh, they had kind of italicized lettering and numbering on the back. And they had a distinctive shape handle. I don't have one within arm's reach of me, of course. But I got a couple of those. Yeah, I have a Coke with you. But yeah, Sears and Montgomery Wards, they sold a lot of, you know, under their own brand names. Oh, uh, uh, uh. Wagner Ware made Wards and Wardway cast iron for Montgomery Ward, you know, under uh, Montgomery Ward's brand name. You know, like I said, Sears had a couple of house names and a lot of unmarked stuff. And they also sold brand name Griswold and Wagner through their catalogs, too. Dang, that was great. Yeah, it's a mess, but eventually I'll get caught up. You know, I never ever quite do get it all the way caught up because I've always got some kind of project going on and half of it's going on right here in my kitchen. But eventually I'll get some spare time to do it. In the summertime when I get home from work, I'm usually pretty well shot. Don't much feel like doing house cleaning. And uh, on the weekends, I got everything else to do that I don't get done during the week. So, you know, you never ever do get caught up on everything. But I keep it reasonably reasonably sanitary anyway even if it's terribly cluttered with bits of iron floating around uh, another brand from montgomery ward lifestyle so yeah uh, best health good life you know i'm trying to remember if that was wagner or griswold but uh yeah good good health best life is yeah geez, let me see I don't have my light on. I know I got at least one of them hanging on the wall. One of these days, once I get things sorted out and organized, I'll probably do... Oh, yeah, that reminds me. Anyway, uh, probably do a little tour of some of the collection that I've got built up and some of the other stuff I got. Yeah, I should at least, at least act like a heat sink. Yeah, they get fairly warm when I got the stove going. You can, you know, they're not hot or anything like that. It ain't going to burn the wall. But you can feel them. You know, they definitely hold some heat on the, hold some heat and radiate it back out when the stove burns down. Burns out, rather, not burns down, not burning down the house. But, uh, I think what I'm going to do, not this coming Friday, but the Friday after, 
I'm going to uh, I'm going to do the members only streams on Friday evenings. You know, instead of doing you know three regular streams and then a member stream on Wednesday night, I'll just keep doing the uh, regular streams on Wednesdays and do the members only once a month on Fridays. You know, probably six thirty to like I said, not this coming Friday, but the Friday after I'll do that. Uh, let's see. Recent BSR find as dimples in order. Uh, dimples, you mean the dimples on the inside of the lid? Uh, the older BSR, uh, the dimples on the inside of the lid were kind of a random pattern. They weren't really lined up or anything like that. And then once you got into the, uh, I think the mid-40s, you know, maybe 1950 or so, they started putting the uh, dimples on the lid, you know, in rows and columns in a regular pattern. So uh, if it's probably a BSR and it has the uh, just kind of random scattered dimples all over on the inside of the lid, that's an, uh, that's an older lid. So the lid at least is, you know, pre-1950, 1945 or so. I'm not exactly sure when they, uh, when they changed that. Cast iron has lead in it, hope not. Uh, not really cast iron itself, but you can get lead, get cast iron kettles and things that have been painted with lead paint. And some of the really, really old enameled cast iron, there's a chance that it might have lead in it. You know, it's not, not all of it, but uh, there were some, some makers and some colors that tend to uh, have lead in them if it was made before about 1900, 1910. So it's not real common. I mean, it's most of the enamel stuff you're going to come across is going to be a lot newer than that. So, you know, but some of the really old enamel stuff, you might want to check it out. Cast iron itself usually doesn't, but some people use cast iron, old cast iron skillets for melting lead. So if it looks like a pan's been burnt off, you know, been subjected to pretty high heat, you know, it might be worth checking into. Uh, did I find the time to get a count on how many pieces? No, I haven't actually sat down and counted. Like I said, that'll probably be one of my member streams. Uh, I don't want to promise it to be the first one when I do it, you know, a week from next, this coming Friday. But, uh, excuse me. But that will be one of the, uh, you know, streams I'll go through my collection and my other piles of stuff that I got floating around here try to get everything sorted out. And uh, uh, you have a chef's pan, you think, as a Wagner? Yeah, Wagner made uh, chef skillets. Uh, Lodge made some chef skillets. I think they still do. You know, they're kind of a chef skillet. Instead of being shaped like a regular pan, it more curves up the sides on the inside, makes it easier to, you know, flip and toss and do chef-type things with them. Uh, yes. Wow, Wardway cast iron is cheap. Uh, the original was... You know, it was a discount brand, and uh, it doesn't sell for as much as a lot of the, uh, you know, brand name Wagner and Griswold stuff. But the prices are coming up. You know, people are getting into interested in collecting it because it was made by Wagner. You know, it's the same, pretty much the same quality as any other Wagner skillet. I mean, talk to, yeah, thank, thank you, Clock. And sweet lead stews. Yeah, yeah, you know, paint chips and gravy sounds like a pretty good meal, and it is tasty, I'll give you that. But you shouldn't uh, shouldn't have it more than once or twice a week. It's not a good idea. Uh, Billy Lee, oh, good night. Watching a couple of days when your phone doesn't buffer so bad. Yeah, between your phone and YouTube, it's YouTube has been doing that a lot to me lately, too. Yeah, I used to, used to uh, melt lead. You know, and that's why I showed you my little lead ladle that I can't reach it anymore. You know, and that was definitely strongly positive for lead because, well, it's got lead in it. No buffer my way, just fry. You know. Yeah, it's uh, been doing it to me quite a bit on, you know, quite a few streams. It'll want to buffer three or four different times during the stream for 
no apparent reason. Yeah, I mean, it could be my phone company, but uh, they're pretty good. So I usually don't have problems with them. But I noticed YouTube put a couple of new things on their homepage. They got YouTube apps. You know, I haven't looked at it yet, but I noticed a little little thing for it. And they've made a few changes. And usually whenever YouTube changes something on the site, they break eight other things and it takes months to fix it. Uh, found a 9A super smooth and light Wagner skillet with the outside rim underside. Yeah, the outside heat ring on them. I'm trying to remember. I'd, I don't think Wagner wear ever. I think all their uh, heat rings were on the outside of the bottom. Yeah. <clears throat> Making me burp. Excuse me. For a filled notch in the grease pour. Yeah, I mean, you could, uh, if it had been used for melting lead or somebody tried to solder up a hole in it or something silly like that, you could uh, definitely get get lead in there if it's been used for you know, Coca-Cola Santa Claus commercials. Yeah, are you saying I'm looking old and gray? Which, of course, I am, but that doesn't bother me any. Of course, I ever tried to play Santa at a mall. I'd end up like Billy Bob Thornton and Bad Santa, I'm sure. Getting in fist fights with the kids. And like I said, you can usually tell if it's if it's gotten rusty and hasn't been used in a while. It'd be tough to uh, tell if a skillet had been used for melting lead. But it, more than likely, it wouldn't have any uh, buildup on the outside. It wouldn't have any of the black greasy crud because it's you know it's such a high heat it would burn all that off. And usually, you can tell if a skillet's been exposed to fairly high heat like that. Yeah, I doubt it'd be much of a fight. Yeah, have you ever seen that movie, Bad Santa? And uh, at one point, Billy Bob beats up a bunch of kids because they're picking on a kid that he had befriended. But yeah, he's this hard drink in there. He's a safe cracker, and the deal is him and his partner robbed these malls over Christmas. Billy Bob plays plays Santa and his buddy plays his elf and they got quite the little scam going yeah it's a great movie it appeals to my sociopathic side I mean what can I say yeah after you watch this when you get speakers yeah I don't know why your old speakers wouldn't work with your new computer you know I mean like I said they're pretty pretty universal maybe your speakers went to hell on you too when your computer died took everything out with it <clears throat> yeah, there'll still be Coke bottles before cans. You can still get those every, you know, they still uh, stock them in stores here and there. Yeah, bad Santa. Uh, Ron had mentioned that his uh, old speakers, his computer died, and his old speakers don't work with his new computer. You know, I was kind of wondering why. Usually it's just, you know, speakers. They just got a stereo, eighth-inch, you know, stereo uh, jack on them. So how far in the booties am I? Uh, we got power lines. That's about it. We're way out from uh, any sort of city utilities. It's about 15 miles into town from here. So yeah, I got my own well. I don't have any uh, any of the urban amenities other than electricity and telephone. Can't get DoorDash. Nobody delivers out here this far. It's a small town anyway, so there's really no places in town that would deliver anyway. Fifteen, not fifty. One five. 
but still a pretty good jaunt. There is a little convenience store about halfway between here and town, so uh, I guess it's only seven miles to leave some sort of outpost of civilization. Well water's the best. Well, mine ain't all that great. It's got tons of iron in it, but uh, there's nothing for it. I could put it in an iron removal system, but never got around to it and you know, it's a hassle and it's expensive because just a regular water softener wouldn't uh, wouldn't really help any. You'd have to get all the iron out first before you ran it through a water softener. Yeah, I'm still way out here. And, it's, you know, I live on a dead-end road on the end of a long driveway, so even getting out to the uh, nearest county road is about a mile and a half altogether. So when it snows and... We're the last ones to get plowed out because it's a little dead end road and there's only a couple of us living back here, so we're not a high priority to get plowed out. So a lot of times it'll be, you know, a couple of days, two or three days after a big snowstorm before we even uh before the dead end road even gets plowed out. Speakers might need yeah, might need an audio driver downloaded for it. I can never live in this country or city boy. Well, whatever makes you comfortable, I guess. Small amount of bleach removes iron. Yeah, but uh, it uh, bleach will make it settle out. You know, so it wouldn't do do much good in the uh, you know wouldn't do much good you know in a household system. Because it would just be constantly settling the iron out, you know, if you had a way to kind of drip bleach into your water. And you just have water, iron falling out and building up inside your pipes. Because if I use bleach in my laundry, you know, yeah, it takes stains out and things like that. But it really draws the rust out of the water, so uh, you end up with uh, rusty looking whites. And between the iron in my water and cast iron, the quintessential Iron Man. Yeah, I've considered, you know, just uh, straining the iron out of my water and selling it for scrap to augment my income. Uh, what's the one piece I would overpay for? I try not to overpay for anything. You know, but there are a few pieces that, uh, if I could actually afford them, I would pay for them. I mean, there's some pretty, pretty cool stuff that's pretty rare. There's a, uh, a Griswold loaf pan. You know, I mean, the things you usually go for like two thousand dollars or so if you can find one that has a lid on it. So it looks like a bread pan with a skillet handle on the side, and then there's a lid that fits over the top of it. <laughs> you knew do as a sociopath, you too. Yeah, I mean, a sociopath would stick together if we weren't sociopaths. Yeah, I hope I don't eat too much red meat, get too much iron in my diet. Yeah, there is a disease, you know, for most people using cast iron is good because a lot of people are short on iron, you know, especially women. But uh, a hemochromati hemochromatitis, I think it's called, something like that. It's a, uh, your body can't metabolize iron and it builds up in your liver. And, uh, you know, they shouldn't use cast iron cookware. But other than that, you know, cast iron is pretty much good for everybody. Because your body doesn't really deal with metals very well, even though you need certain metals like, you know, iron. But uh, apart from alkali metals like magnesium, sodium, you know, calcium, that are water soluble and you can just flush through, your body doesn't metabolize metals very well. And what it'll do is it'll try and store it somewhere until it can very slowly get rid of it. Iron gets stored in the liver. Uh, lead and mercury get stored in the nervous system which causes huge problems you know some get stored in different organs different parts of the body so uh new computer none of my old speakers work with it and there's a speaker in the tower but not very good i could last week okay yeah But yeah, I mean, it is possible to overdose on iron, 
you know, but most people are actually short on iron and kind of anemic. So using cast iron is beneficial for their diet. But if you know you have the uh, like hemo, hemochromatosis, I think it's called. You know, I'm not exactly positive. Heard cast iron wasn't good for women after menopause. Uh, not that I know of. You know, it's new to me. I haven't heard that. It's possible, but I don't know. So, yeah, whiskey heals everything, pretty much. You know, there's there's few things that can't be solved with enough whiskey. And if you end up getting a hangover the next day, more whiskey will take care of that too. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Well, we're getting up on an hour here, so I'll wind things up. Like I said, I'm going to try and uh, do a member's live stream not this coming Friday, but the next one. And I'll just keep doing my regular live streams, you know, on Wednesday nights during the week. And uh, I think that'll work out a little bit better rather than skipping a regular one and doing the, doing the members one on, on uh, Wednesdays too. So that'll be nice. Uh, estimate how many pounds you have in all my cast iron piece. Well, let's see, most of the vintage number eight, pan, number nine pans go about four pounds a piece. They're a good bit lighter than newer ones, three and a half to four pounds. So on that wall would be, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Probably about 60 to 70 pounds of iron hanging on the wall. You know, not as much as you'd think. I mean, you'd think there'd be, you know, 500 pounds worth of iron hanging there, but it's not really all that much, even though it is quite a bit. Uh, do I have a Griswold round griddle with a bale handle? Does it flip up when you pick it up? Uh, it'll tilt and rock, you know, but it won't flip over, usually. I'm trying to remember it, and I think it only... The, the uh, bale will only fold down one way, like a lot of Dutch ovens. But I do have two uh, two big gr round Griswold griddles, yeah, with the bale handles. Is it? Yeah, good day from New Zealand. It's good to see you, Stephen. Uh, good night, thanks. But yeah, anyway, uh, like I said, I'm winding this up. I'm going to try and make a video this weekend. We're uh, playing with that apple skeever pan again. You know, gonna give the uh, making brownies in it a try, and uh, I got some stuff that'll make pretty good filling for them too. I think so. That would be fun. Hopefully, I'll be able to get it uh, get her done this weekend. If not for too long, I will. But that was uh, thanks to Brian Smith. You know, at uh, Mr. Smith's Kitchen now he calls his channel. And uh, go check him out if you get a chance. Mr. Smith's Kitchen. And uh, yeah, he's a pretty fun guy. I like him. And he's one of our channel members here. So like, subscribe. Hit the like button on your way out. If you feel so inclined, you can join the channel. Get the goodies that they get. You know, giveaways now and then. Uh, Facebook page for members only. And live streams once a month or so for uh, members only. Those are kind of nice. But anyway, I'm going to wrap this up and say goodnight to everybody. Thanks for showing up. It's always good to see you all. And I'll see you guys again next week.